Good morning, and I thank the organizers of this extremely important hearing, which I hope will help uh, draw global attention to the lack of justice for crimes uh, against uh, committed against journalists worldwide. I think it's a historic moment in the pursuit of justice for our own slain uh, editor, as well as all other journalists who have been harmed. I consider it an honor to have been invited to submit this uh, testimony uh, as a former staffer. I would like to request the tribunal to kindly grant me permission uh, to read out a very brief statement as part of my testimony. Thank you, please go ahead. Thank you. For many people, Lasanta Vikramatunga was a trailblazing investigative journalist, a force, a powerful critic of the establishment. But for us, he was a much loved editor whose leadership skills, interpersonal skills, human kindness, cheerful nature, made him an extremely endearing and beautiful human being. We had the pleasure and the privilege of working with. He had an amazing network of human sources and incomparable capacity to verify information and the gift of, uh, of, um, gift of a prosecuting attorney to complete his, uh, complete his stories with great attention to detail that ensured nothing went missing in the stories he did. He also, however, evoked contrasting emotions. Uh, he was loved, respected and valued by the progressive elements in our country, for he had the courage to speak truth to power and to accept the consequences that came with it. As much as he was loved, he was also feared and hated by some, which brings us to the purpose of this hearing itself. So needless to say, in our country, the pursuit of justice for Lassanta has not borne fruit. We are extremely thankful for the opportunity presented by the People's Tribunal. And it is our fervent hope that this process would contribute to achieving justice for a man who fearlessly defended the rights of others and sacrificed his life, speaking truth to power. Uh, when I interviewed him on 2nd of October, 2008, I had no idea that it was likely to be his final interview as a journalist. I was compiling a media status report for the Asian Media Forum at the time, and we published this report with his quotes posthumously. In this interview, he also spoke about uh, the role of narrative makers and also about embedded journalism. And these were the years of uh, war and towards we were moving towards the end of the war as well. I quote from parts of my interview notes, Journalists must be mindful of getting involved in dangerous narrative making. The question to ask would be, is it for the greater good of the people whose voice journalists are meant to represent? The government has crafted a master narrative and there is more and more buy-in from various media houses. This narrative is particularly dangerous as it as it tends to feed racism, it tends to fuel divisions and thrives on rhetoric, but not the answers to the festering wounds that had engulfed our country. The media is being used to promote racism. The master narrative is about heroism of some, and this includes some journalists. There are restrictions on the coverage of the war. Media organizations gain access by becoming embeds and end up reproducing government handouts and call it journalism. If you go on, uh, if you go on government sponsored tours to the conflict areas and present only the viewpoint uh, that is given to you to the exclusion of the suffering of civilians, their political angst, their right to life, food and a home of their own and to their safe of their safety, your story is less than half baked. It is a dangerous plight, which is not unique to Sri Lanka, but one that is chosen by authoritarian regimes everywhere. Journalists should understand the critical role they play in covering conflict and war. We must not be fooled into reporting that there is heroism in triumphalist coverage of the oppressed, of the tyranny of bombing your own people and calling it collateral damage. When journalists are killed too, they too are considered collateral damage. Should we be accepting that? I close quote. 
In Sri Lanka, many journalists have been killed, subjected to enforced disappearances, assaults, assaulted, threatened, and intimidated for many years under the watch of many governments. The decade of 2005 to 2015 was possibly the darkest in our living memory for journalists and media workers. You have already heard the grim statistics from other witnesses. We continue to live in that darkness. It is not just our editor, but many others who are still awaiting justice and closure. There had been limited progress, and if the rulers from 2005 to 2015 are primarily and morally responsible for the crimes committed under their watch, the governments that followed are also complicit in perpetuating injustice and impunity. There is no exoneration from guilt in the people's court. So far, not a single person has been convicted for crimes against journalists, and only two cases have reached the prosecution. Um, I would like to conclude my statement by saying, Lasantha's murder is a brutal example of killing the messenger and of state tyranny. It illustrates the times we lived in, the difficulties with which the Sunday leader operated at the time, always under surveillance, under threat of persecution, facing frivolous litigation, assault and murder. A journalist who was driving, driving to work that morning with his pen and notebook beside him was killed in cold blood and his killer still roam free. There is patriotism that is blind and meek of blind faith and of allegiance. And then there is patriotism that questions power and demands accountability and transparency. I think Lasanta chose the latter. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Handanetti. Um, you told us that you interviewed Lasanta. Could you tell us a little bit more about your work as a journalist? Okay. Um, I've been working as a journalist for uh, over 26 years now. Um, I'm, a, I'm a lawyer by training and I work as a journalist in Colombo. Um, I've worked at uh, about six newspapers so far. Um, I left the institution, um, the final uh, newspaper that I worked for in 2019 to set up a nonprofit newsroom dedicated to investigative reporting. Um, when I joined the Sunday Leader, um, I started covering politics and parliament, and uh, I also expanded uh, my uh, reporting to cover, uh, to cover South Asia. Um, I think it was an important milestone for me to be appointed as editor investigations as, at, at, at the newspaper, at, at the Sunday lead, Leader, with uh, three team members um, working with me. Um, it was truly an honor to have worked with uh, La Santa and to uh, run this desk for over eight years. Um, and, you know, doing stories of different kinds, but mostly pro uh, focusing on grand corruption of human rights abuses um, and, and the like. Um, I did significant amounts of political reporting during that time. We interviewed uh, people that who were considered sometimes uh, not available, a lot of people and not easily accessed. Uh, so um, as most people know, the Sunday leader did write a lot of stories uh, on uh, grand corruption and uh, also rights abuses. I did uh, extensive writing on the need for, for a political solution uh, and also covered South Asia. Um, have, I've had the opportunity to interview most of the presidents in Sri Lanka and, uh, in, uh, and also the current prime minister. So it's been a wide spectrum of reportage, being able to go to conflict uh, ridden areas to speak to uh, during the years of uh, where, du during when the truce was uh, in place, uh, was able to travel to the north and um, also bring out, uh, uh, bring out stories uh, from, from the ground level and also to talk to uh, people like the, uh, the then LTT political head, S.P. Tamil Selvam, the chief negotiator, Anton Balasingham and Puli Devan, and uh, also Balasingham Narasimha, you know, they were of the uh, LTT peace secretariat among them. So I think the Sunday leader had a different uh, way of presenting stories and uh, also reflecting 
all the angles. So while others did not do those stories, I think we were fortunate enough to uh, bring out stories from a region that we did not cover because we all live, live in. Um, also, we broke many stories um, during that period. Um, I remember doing this 14 part, uh, 14 part uh, series on abductions and extortions racket targeting Tamils and Muslims in Sri Lanka. I've also reported on the eviction of Tamils from uh, Tamils temporarily living in uh, Colombo in the year 2007. Um, they were evicted uh, by a circular issued by the then uh, secretary uh, to the Ministry of Defense. They were loaded into buses on 7th June 2007 and evicted for not having uh, a particular reason for being in Colombo. But uh, uh, many of them had applied for jobs and were staying at lodging places in Colombo to face their interviews with manpower companies and so on. Um, this order was also subsequently challenged in court. Um, long before um, many were really... I'm sorry, Ms. Handanetti, can you please slow down for the translators? Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, there was also a time when uh, some of the family members of uh, the Rajapakshas were not known. A case in point was our former finance minister, Basil Rajapaksha. Um, I remember Lasanta asking me to do a small profile uh, of... Uh, of Basil Rajpaksha saying that he's gonna play a key role in Sri Lankan politics on a future date. And uh, this definitely happened. Um, through this exercise, we also learned that we needed to do our own research. We needed to uh, power documents, be able to analyze data. And uh, the, uh, the Sunday leader was a good place to learn and practice all of that. And uh, eventually after um, I did that. I, I did that profiling of uh, um, the former finance minister. I also broke a story about tsunami housing uh, in the Hambantota district where the Rajapakshas come from. Um, I worked at the Sunday Leader till the year 2009, August 2009, and. Uh, Took a much needed break afterwards and uh, joined the, the Joint Transparency International as director of uh, director advocacy, and I had the opportunity to work on systemic uh, corruption. So I've, like many others, I've made my appearances before the Criminal Investigations Department, recorded exhaustive statements, been threatened, attended court, uh, exhaustive court proceedings over several years. And along the way, uh, won awards for the journalism we did, uh, but nothing can take away the hurt and the pain of uh, having our editor brutally killed. Um, in making this testimony, I think it's also important to say, um, and I really want to emphasize this fact, this country belongs to 22 million people and it does not belong just to some people. It's nobody's private property. Uh, we all have a right to live, practice our craft without being threatened, without getting abducted, without being assaulted, and certainly not being killed and, and not being driven into self-exile. And I hope these proceedings help us to uh, emphasize this fact and work towards that. Ms. Handanetti, you mentioned that you broke a few stories while you were at the Sunday Leader. Can you describe to us the role of the Sunday Leader in the media landscape in Sri Lanka and in particular the contribution that La Santa had as the editor there? Okay, um, thank you. Uh, the Sunday Leader, I think, was a celebration of dissent. It was a place where there was space for divergent viewpoints. Uh, we definitely took editorial positions and there was collective agreement generally within the editorial that these are positions to be defended, uh, to be supported. Um, it was also published during an extremely di difficult period in Sri Lankan history. Um, as we all know, there were regular threats of attacks on the institution and its people. Uh, no Southern newsroom had suffered the way the Sunday leader has 
And I think that's really important to record here that no other Southern newsroom had gone through what the Sunday leader had gone through. And I do say this, not just counting um, the loss of property because others may have lost uh, property, but um, thinking about the human cost the Sunday leader had to bear. Uh, Lasanta had been attacked many times. His house had been attacked. There, were, uh, there was an arson attack when, after I joined the paper. Uh, they set fire to the printing press of the leader and journalists lived under constant threat of being attacked uh, and definitely remained under surveillance. Um, so in terms of Sunday leader's value, we were a group of dissenters in terms of opinion. Um, perhaps radical journalists, uh, but we were never the promoters of violence. The promoters of violence were elsewhere. The, editorials, uh, the editorial was quite alternate. Uh, we were liberal in our values and uh, we also were inclusive. We had uh, stated positions diametrically opposite to those of uh, to many other media institutions at that time. And I think that made us not very popular. Uh, with the powers that be. Uh, we did not uh, reflect the master narrative of the state. Um, and there were, it is not to say that it was only the Sunday leader, there were other honorable exceptions as well. Uh, from helping Hamban Tota, uh, which was related, which was linked to uh, the tsunami funding and the siphoning out of tsunami funds that came to Sri Lanka. Uh, to the MIG deal that we hopefully are going to talk about. Um, Sunday leader definitely uh, showed and practiced courageous public interest journalism till its end. Uh, its brand may have angered and upset many, but it was also a reflection of our state at that time, full of cracks and bleeding. Uh, we have also been uh, vindicated today when people demand accountability of our country's leaders, citing the stories that we produced over a period of years. Um, we did it at great, great risk uh, to ourselves as a team. And of course, uh, they did have been killed for the kind of reporting we did. But it is good to think that we were futuristic and we were certainly reform oriented. Uh, in terms of presenting Sunday leader's value, I would, I would say that we were liberal. We did not promote war or bombing of our own citizens. Uh, we stood for a negotiated political uh, settlement for human rights, for freedom of expression and the space for dissent. So week after week, uh, week, after week we, uh, we reported on government corruption, abuse of power and many rights violations. So the, uh, the Sunday leader kept the hate and harm directed at all of us. Notwithstanding all of that, we kept the nation well informed. And that's a role nobody plays today. Thank you. Can you tell us when you first met Lasanta? Okay. Um, I uh, met him as a junior reporter working for a different newspaper. And uh, he was this famous editor, he was this famous journalist, uh, famous columnist writing. Uh, he used to pen a column uh, um, under his pen name, Suranimal. It was extremely popular. And uh, his writing was also very different. I'd say more like a prosecutor closing all gaps, removing all doubts and moving pieces of information, um, you know, uh, to, uh, to augment his argument. In, an, in his um, very, very well-crafted uh, columns. I remember him as this larger than life columnist with an endearing smile, but we uh, then subsequently when he was starting the Sunday leader, it was not La Santa, but his uh, then wife, uh, Rain, who asked me to join the editorial, but I did not. Um, I joined uh, in 2001, but I would like to state uh, something about uh, him. I was transitioning from one newspaper to the other, and I, I'd applied for this scholarship um, in Johannesburg, and I uh, a UN scholarship, and I needed a letter of support from an editor. And uh, I've been talking to him about joining the Sunday Leader, 
I needed this uh, letter from an editor and he provided me with this letter um, even, even before I joined his staff. So I don't think um, a lot of people do that kind of thing. Uh, so that's how I remember him. Generally, he's uh, very supportive of his staff and uh, helpful in many ways. Can you tell us more about the MIG deal investigation that I understand you conducted with La Santa? Okay. Um, the, uh, well, uh, he got the information and uh, at that time I was running the investigations desk. So I commenced the series and filed the first of the stories. The other stories were uh, filed by someone else. That was because I was going away on a, um, I, I went away uh, for a short period of time on a short course. But doing that story taught me a lot about documentation of um, verification and the kind of energy that needs to go into doing a story. Um, we secured the initial documents and then we had, uh, we had to, get many more, um, we had to procure more documents. Uh, and uh, this related to technical evaluations, how technical evaluations are done. Uh, we are journalists, we do not have expertise on, you know, on fire aircrafts and how technical evaluations are conducted uh, by the Sri Lanka Air Force. So um, I spent a significant, uh, I spent, an, uh, spent a significant amount of time talking to experts, uh, getting, uh, getting their feedback, trying to understand how uh, these deals are struck and uh, what is considered uh, by a technical evaluation committee. And uh, this took about three weeks. There were four uh, MiG fighters involved in this purchase and uh, the experts they, uh, concluded during those interviews and I preserved them. Um, they were not airworthy and would be considered a bad investment. Uh, then we had to also uh, locate this company called uh, Belimisa Holdings Limited. And we also discovered that uh, the provided address was false. There was a phone number which was not uh, being answered. Whenever we uh, telephoned, it was quite frustrating, I remember. Uh, we did not realize at that point that this was actually a non-existent company that we were chasing, uh, but we kept trying. We also attempted then to trace the bank account um, opened in 2006, just before uh, the MIG deal was uh, signed up. And uh, this account was traced to the British, uh, British Virgin Islands. Uh, we did manage to get a photograph of the provided address uh, of this shell company through a close uh, associate living in London. So uh, it was not easy to do because uh, it is beyond uh, the technical capacity of some of us and we worked very hard. Uh, we took some time uh, to complete that uh, story. But uh, I would like to mention a few things about this story, though at least uh, the first one I did and I assisted with the second and I was away thereafter. These, uh, these questionable purchases have been publicly defended and also in court, questions about the purchase uh, have also been explained only in one particular way that the chief accounting officer was responsible for all the financial transactions and the war was won because of these fighters. So this has been, again, the popular narrative and this was the one that was uh, put forward by the government. Uh, it if, is... If I, may, if I may stop you for a second, uh, because what you're saying is very interesting. Can you clarify for us, what is the nature of the deal? Who was engaged in the purchase and what was the amount that we're discussing? Okay. Um, it was supposed to be a government to government deal. And uh, the procurement had been uh, was cited as a contract between the manufacturing government, the uh, Ukraine, and the government of Sri Lanka. Uh, so it was supposed to be a government to government deal and the fund transfer should be made to the relevant bank account technically uh, of the representative government's institution. The money for the MIG uh, 27 purchase were 
uh, unfortunately not paid to a bank account of this particular, uh, you know, Ukrimash, the company, uh, the state res uh, representative company, but to this other account of the UK company named Belimiza Holdings. The story was important for it exposed not just uh, the kind of procurement deals that were going on, uh, it opened the lid on, uh, on the kind of uh, military related deals that were taking place. I cannot particularly tell you the exact amount right now because I do not have the document and I would not want to give you uh, wrong information. Um, so what I do remember is uh, in the story that I covered, the first story, uh, but what we discovered was the existence of this ghost company, the failure to contact them, and the fact that um, the money has been transferred to an account that was not supposed to be uh, the official account. And it was also clearly not a government to government deal as it was presented to uh, Sri Lanka and to the world. Uh, this story was important because of the expo, uh, uh, because we could. Uh, for the first time, really present corruption in military deals, and um, and we were really brought under tremendous pressure um, after that. And we also understand uh, the newspapers' closure in so many ways. The pressures we felt, uh, the kind of pushback we got, uh, were quite directly linked to uh, the story series not only this, but uh, many others, I'm sure. But uh, the reports are unfortunately not available online as the Sunday Leader archive also does not exist anymore. Um, after the first story, which raised a hornet's nest, uh, as I mentioned, I traveled overseas and uh, they'd been, uh, the Sunday Leader has uh, in 2005, the Sunday leader tendered an unqualified apology for the article series. But as the writer of the original story, the very first story, I think it is the right time for me to say that, that um, the reporting was done with great care. And uh, we took great efforts to make sure that information was verified. And we were extremely truthful to what we were working on. And uh, I'd really say, I, I'd really want to say that I stand by every word that went into print in the initial report. Thank you. Can you tell us more about the response of the military, of the state and of the Sri Lankan population more broadly to this report on the MIG deal that you published? Okay, I think there were multiple responses, at least the two key ones would be there were people who suddenly opened their eyes and realized it was happening in Sri Lanka as well. Most of the time when we, uh, when we read about or watch on, you know, watch documentaries, corruption of this, uh, corruption of this magnitude happened somewhere else in someone else's country, some other place. But this was happening at home. So the shock that we saw and the public response, which was also positive, was also there. But on the other hand, uh, as we always experience, here, here was a newsroom that was always pushed against the wall, always tried in multiple ways. And uh, the pushback was, uh, well, it was, uh, there were multiple ways in which we felt the pressure and, I'm, uh, and I do understand that the, edi uh, the editor received um, serious threats. And uh, there, were, uh, there were two ways of, re uh, there, there were responses of different kind. One was the litigation, which I do not wish to uh, discuss here, uh, except to say, uh, except to re reiterate what I said, that I stand by every word I wrote. And uh, so there was litigation, and there was uh, uh, there was this legal pressure to not uh, not uh, do, uh, and, you know continue with that kind of reportage. So that's one thing. Uh, having to pay heavy damages for the stories that you write can be really trying, and a small, particularly on a small newsroom without the kind of resources. And the second thing is. Uh, 
the kind of threat that you bring and and when you target the leadership of that editorial and as we all know the editor has been killed and uh, the reporters also felt a lot of pressure and I was told that I was lucky that I was away after the first story and the other reporter they, uh, who did the other stories who researched and compiled those stories um, he had to uh, leave the country as well uh, this is also documented so uh, they were extremely difficult times with multiple multiple threats um, all kinds of pressures being brought up uh, you know uh, pressures were there for the editorial to bear. Can you clarify the timeline for us? When did you publish the story? And December 2006, yeah. We started working on the story around the, uh, in you know, the latter part of 2006. And we published uh, in, sorry, we published in 2007. I started publishing in 2007. The stories were published in 2007. And can you speak about the threats that La Santa and the Sunday leader received in the period preceding his murder? Okay. Um, I also, I, I think La Santa protected us in a way that he did not always share the threats that he faced. And uh, of course we got to know about some and of, while protecting his staff, he definitely protected all of us, including myself, we have all, or we have, all of us have had some issue or the other uh, at different times. The Sunday Leader editorial, anyway, lived on edge. The newspaper had suffered multiple attacks, and La Santa had, and his former wife Rain, and they also suffered physical attacks. So just before the, just before uh, this, um, I've heard, I've learned uh, that. Uh, he was threatened in many different ways and uh, he would only share some of it. Uh, he always showed us that brave, uh, brave face. Um, but I remember a couple of incidents that I'd like to share here. Um, there were certain telephone calls that he received and uh, sometimes he would refer to those. And at least in one occasion, he replayed one of those recorded conversations. And uh, we did not think it was, unfortunately, uh, this was something that he probably experienced many times. And there were many, many such calls. But uh, in this case, um, I remember a particular person saying that you'll be killed if you, if you touch, you know, if you re report on certain things that you'll be killed so that that kind of call, uh, you know, that kind of recordings were available with him. And uh, when he was assaulted, among the first things that went, uh, that he lost uh, were the telephones. The telephones went, uh, went missing. Um, so uh, then I also remember in uh, close to that time, there were, uh, there were letters that were posted and we would receive it in the post or delivered to one was delivered to the security uh, to, uh, at the security post, and uh, when you opened that envelope, uh, it had it had the Sunday leader one of the Sunday leader pages, and across the page, uh, there, you know, in red um, ink, it was scribbled that you'll be killed. So we have seen we have seen many of these things over a period of years. So we don't. Uh, as an editorial, I don't think we always understood when the threat level escalated, but I'm sure he knew. And uh, I, I also understand towards the end of 2008, there were, uh, the threat level had really seriously risen and um, he was under surveillance and he was being followed. Uh, there were a lot of threats than whatever that we have experienced before. Could you tell us more about the impact of his murder on yourself, on your colleagues, and on, on the community more generally in Sri Lanka? Um, since 2004, uh, the situation, um, since, uh, yeah, uh, with, uh, with the war, uh, in 2006, Sri Lanka was going into a fully blown up war. So obviously the situation turned very tense. Um, so among, 
we have just been informed that we are unable to reach Miss Handanetti again. We will connect with Miss Handanetti and find out a time when the judges can meet with her and address their questions to her directly.